Uh, in terms of our, uh, our flow for today, we're going to actually kick off our time together with a short video from um, the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And if you don't already know about that group, they are amazing. They have a ton of great resources around, as you might imagine, child development. But there's a really great short video that is, is a wonderful way to underpin the work that Child Haven is doing. So after we watch that, it's about five minutes, we'll watch that video together, and then I will pass it over to our CEO, John Botton, and our Chief Program Officer, Mark Fadul, and we'll talk through how that connects with our work, where we're headed, and then they'll open it up for, for more conversation and questions after they get through the first little bit of their, their talk. So with no further ado, Sakaya, I'm going to pass it off to you and have you share the video. The social challenges that face modern societies, whether it's the ability to work productively, to be a good citizen, stay healthy, have their roots in early health and development. A strong foundation in early childhood results in much better and more effective development later. A weak foundation really puts us behind. The most important thing children need to thrive is to live in an environment of relationships that begins in their family, but also extends out to include adults who are family members in childcare centers and other programs. What children need is for that entire environment of relationships to be invested in their healthy development. We've shown from decades of testing interventions that we can improve outcomes. But the magnitude of those impacts is not good enough. Science is now available to help us think about what we might do that would have a bigger impact than the best of what we've done before. So we began to ask, what could we be doing differently? What could we do to be smarter? Children who are at the greatest risk for the poorest outcomes in learning and health and behavior are children who experience a pile-up, a cumulative burden of one after another after another of risk factors. And then the burden is more than any child could be expected to overcome. So we began to focus on the development of the adults. What could we be doing to strengthen the capacity of everyone who interacts with children? This led us to think about the kinds of skills you need to deal with adversity these skills of focusing attention, planning, monitoring, delaying gratification, being able to solve problems, being able to work in teams, executive function and self-regulation. They're also the kind of skills you need to create a well-regulated home and school environment in which healthy development and learning can take place. And then brain science started to tell us that differences in those skills start to develop in infancy based on the environment kids live in. So how do those skills get built? Well, if you don't develop them early, how do you develop them later? Actually, you can build them later because the period of flexibility and plasticity for this part of the brain doesn't fully mature until age 25 to 30. So then the light bulb went on. The reason we're not getting a bigger impact is not because we don't know about how to influence development, but because we're giving information and advice to people who we need to do active skill building with. Skill building by coaching, by training, by practice, but we're not doing that. So we now have developed this theory of change that says we need to focus on the development of the adults who are important in kids' lives. So try this. How does that work? That's a new idea. Buen trabajo. We need to focus on their skills, their needs, in order for them to be better, more effective parents, in order for them to be better prepared to be employable, which would enhance the economic stability of the family, which is also good for children. Second of all, we looked at many people in preschool programs and child care centers. And we said, what are we doing to build those skills in the providers? They need skill building as well. And also the community can help to build and reinforce 
the capacities that parents need. And the community also includes programs in which the people who work in the programs have sufficient skills. Third of all, what are the major sources of toxic stress in this community, and how can we reduce them? Moving it up to a policy level, how are our policies strengthening communities' abilities to reduce sources of toxic stress and caregivers' abilities to provide what kids need? The development of our human capital is our future. The development of a productive workforce is our future. The development of a healthy population is our future. This kind of future orientation is critical for healthy society. It's critical for a thriving business. It's critical for a successful environment of relationships to raise children. It's all about being able to plan for the future, to have a future. And that's why this is so important. That is an amazing video. And Brianni, thank you for sharing it with everybody. Um, by no means am I preaching, but please share it with friends and family and have, have conversations about it because as the doctor said, what can we do differently? We indifferently stand out to be in that. So this is what we're gonna be doing today together and hopefully it's a positive contagion that will continue to spread. John. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. If there's any doubt about how special you are, um, I'm here to say that Mark shaved and took his sweats off and put on a, a big boy shirt today. And I, this is the first time I've had a button up shirt on in, in two years. So uh, we're pulling out all the stops for you. Um, we're gonna do a, a quick, quick summary of the highlights of the video that you just watched, specifically tying them to our strategic impact plan. So there's five key takeaways from the video that we want you to, to hold in mind. Um, the first is that childhood trauma and adversity are the root cause of the most urgent and costly pro problems that plague our children, families, and communities. Um, in, in 2019, Psychology Today, uh, did a, a huge study on the actual cost to society of adverse childhood experiences and environments. And that total cost in North America and Europe alone is $1.33 trillion a year. So what, what we're doing is we're not investing in the upstream solutions, we're investing in the downstream repercussions at a huge cost to our society. The second big takeaway is that that the children who are at greatest risk for the poorest outcomes are those who have the most toxic stress as caused by the largest, largest pile of adverse childhood experiences and environments. And uh, Mark, could you, could you do a quick summary on the, the original ACEs study and then subsequent studies after that? Sure. So the ACEs study was really something that um, Kaiser Permente out of San Diego stumbled upon. So in the 1980s, they had an obesity clinic. And what they noticed was um, a lot of individuals that were in the obesity clinic were successful in learning new skills um, to reduce their weight. What they were surprised by was around 50% of those participants. And most of these participants were um, Caucasian. They were um, middle-class, upper-middle-class educated. Around 50% of them dropped out and they started to scratch their head and go, you know, what, Dr. Folletti, what is going on? So they they did something that was really smart and that was interview. They just wanted to learn and, and listen and learn. And what they found out was the folks that dropped out, um, almost all of them had been sexually abused or had some type of abuse history as a child, adverse childhood experience. And they were losing weight, but as they lost weight, they felt as if they were more noticeable. And that means that to them, it meant that they could be victimized again. And so it was a fascinating um, um, series of studies that um, transpired after uh, that San Diego obesity clinic discovery, uh, which has led us now to really taking a look at more than the 10 factors that were, were in the original study. Um, and you can see some of them here realizing that so many um, young people have adverse childhood experiences across social economic 
uh, lines. But the thing is, when you add racism, incarceration, all the things that you see here, um, the number one thing that really um, causes adverse uh, childhood um, experiences to be a, a death sentence is there needs to be buffers. There needs to be positive adults in kids' lives, parents, aunties, grandmothers, clergy, a boys and girls uh, a st um, club staff, et cetera. And so we've learned an awful lot. And um, to be quite honest, it is not a death sentence. It's, it's actually a fantastic study that leads to all kinds of ways that Child Haven and other agencies are, have the antidote to uh, childhood trauma. So if adverse childhood experiences and environments are the root cause of the most urgent and costly problems that we face as society, then the anecdote that Mark just touched on is that safe, safe stable, nurturing relationships and environments are the essential key to mitigating childhood trauma and adversity and assuring that all children are able to reach their full potential. So um, Dr. Sean Koff, who um, narrated the video there, he had a, a, a saying that I came across earlier in my tenure at Child Haven is constructively dissatisfied with the status quo. And we've really adopted that here at Child Haven um, and even built it into our, our, our values. Um, and the reason is uh, he coined that term is because we have proven that we can improve outcomes for kids and families, but the, the magnitude of that impact is really frankly pretty small. And so unless we kind of say that's not good enough, you know, for all that we are investing into, you know, prevention and early intervention services, the outcomes we're getting for that investment really is not uh, up to par in our, our opinion. Um, and so we, we did a deep dive organizationally into why is that? What does the science say? What does the research say? What are the best thinkers across the world say is the reason why outcomes aren't improving for kids and families? And a big piece of it is, is related to this, and that's that most solutions to these problems have historically focused exclusively on applying programmatic fixes, i.e. services, to the symptoms of failing systems rather than transforming the systems themselves to catalyze enduring change. So in other words, we can throw a lot of services at, at kids and families and communities, but if we aren't addressing the root cause of what is creating those problems in the first place, we're really not gonna make the, the size of headway that we wanna make. So we once we kind of digested that and we looked at what is Child Haven's kind of unique and special role that we can provide in the community, we set off on, on creating a strategic impact plan. We took about a year, our, our leadership and board of directors, um, spent about a year wrestling with this and, um, and really just like almost remarkably in keeping with the theme of the video, we, we honed in on three specific areas that we wanted to focus on. One is en enriching uh, relationships for children um, everywhere they exist. So not just when they're with us, but everywhere in which kids live, learn and play. Um, the second strategy or kind of focus area is building and enhancing the workforce. And the third is forming partnerships to address those silos and systems that are keeping problems entrenched in our communities. Mark, you want to add anything to that before we go on to the strategies themselves? Once again, I think it's, it's a massive paradigm switch from um, fixing, having the attitude that you're going to fix um, uh, folks um, it's not what you're doing to them, it's working with them. Um, and that really the basis of that is, is the purest sense of, of humanity. And that is forming, trusting, uh, relationships and building and building rapport. And oftentimes in communities that have plenty of reason not to trust institutions. So it's, it's, it's a lot slower process, but it's a much more effective. So holding those, those three points in mind, what we did is created a strategic impact plan that is really working at what we call three tiers. So if you look on the left-hand side of your screen here, you've got progress towards our vision, which we'll, we'll share with you in a minute. And then on the, on the bottom, you have the amount of time it takes to make the impact. So our, our first tier set of strategies at what we call the child or family level. And the overarching objective here is to strengthen infrastructure and direct services with the goal of growing uh, our services at the point we were 
we were creating the plan was about 300 to 350 kids and families and services. So to grow from that to over 3,000 in the, in the subsequent three years, approximately one year in now, and we're serving about 1,500 kids and families. So we're making really nice progress um, towards that goal. There are three strategies within this tier, and that's grow our continuum of care, focus on infant and early childhood mental health, or, or sometimes referred to as early relational health, and then improve the infrastructure within the organization that will enable us to kind of build on, on top of a, a strong base. Um, Mark, could you talk a little bit about kind of growing our continuum of care, as well as our focus on, on early uh, childhood? Um, and, and for those who aren't familiar, about four or five years ago, Child Haven only had one service, and over time, we've grown to now have 13 or 14 different services that we provide. Sure, John. You know, I think that once again, going back to um, being uh, constructively dissatisfied with the status quo, I, um, you know, John is very humble and John and Dr. Beers, uh, who was our chief program officer, uh, and many, many others put so much work into, first of all, awareness, getting that information that's out there. And then really taking a look at our agency and, and going, wait a second, maybe what we're doing, we could do better, just what you what you heard from Dr. Shankov. And with that came this kind of radical change in regards to we need to figure out how to improve access. We need to change our stance, realizing that parents and caretakers are the experts of their children. We need to figure out ways of partnering. Um, and breaking down power hierarchies. And so therefore, with the um, uh, uh, continuum of care, too many times our systems uh, across the board, especially for those that are in need most, make it so extremely challenging and, and for the most part, almost impossible to get the care they need. So you go to one office, you finally get an appointment. It might be at two o'clock. You might have to take work off. You might have to take two buses to get that to that appointment with your little child. And then you get a referral to see a mental health provider that you don't know the agency. You don't know where it's at. You're gonna have to take more time off, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea with this continuum of care is there's no wrong door that we are gonna build programs that are gonna be upstream preventative early intervention programs as, as you see the second bullet, uh, because we know that's where we get our biggest bang for our buck from an economic standpoint, but from, uh, efficacious standpoint, we, we know that's where real meaningful change can take place um, for, for a lifetime. So the combination of having programs that complement each other, enhance each other, that easy access, no wrong door uh, is, is absolutely key. And you, you'll see some of that in the um, follow-up slides. There you have it. Thank you, John. So I know I don't want to spend too much time, but this gives you kind of a nice layout of um, our different sectors. And the thing is, we could have arrows that point to all the different, like, for example, our WISE program is our intensive wraparound program, and we've designed it to work with families with uh, young kids, uh, zero to six. And it's, it's a wonderful program with teams of three that work with families in their homes in the community. Um, the thing is, it's it's so intense that once folks, we really want folks not to be dependent on our services, but once they graduate from WISE, they might need a little support. And that's where our outpatient behavioral health um, uh, step comes in the play. All these programs complement, and you'll see the home visiting, you know, we have Healthy Start and they do um, uh, the PAP model, parents as teachers, and they go into homes. All these are really designed to, um, early intervention and, and prevention, and they, they definitely complement each other. Next one. So I, I often think of our strate strategic objectives as levers. So kind of um, when, we, when we stood back and we looked at our, our vision, the difference we want to make at the world, and if we were only working at the child and family level, we recognize we weren't gonna make the kind of progress that we needed to make. So we needed a bigger level. And so the next lever up is at the community level uh, where our overarching objective is to expand workforce and indirect services. So working through the work of others uh, and there our goal is to influence um, 30,000 uh, different individuals. Uh, three strategies there is to embed our services more within the community as opposed to 
expecting everybody to come to us. It's much more common now for us to go to them. Uh, establish an infant early childhood mental health workforce development hub, and then uh, expand to a new location in a community that, that might need us more than uh, where our Broadway location is on, on kind of Capitol Hill here. So Mark, what kind of comments you have for those three? I know when you were interviewing for Child Haven, mm. this area particularly stood out to you as, as pretty revolutionary and bold. Well, I, you know, I'm going to go with what stands out the most, and that is, I remember when I first uh, met you and Megan, John, that um, you were sh you had shared that uh, you were in the we were in the process of um, selling our Broadway building, and every, almost everyone knows the Broadway Child Haven building. It's iconic, and um, and explain the reason why in regards to once again access to the folks that needed the most. It was not advantageous. And also it, it was somewhat, you know, for years, Child Haven provided amazing services, the best services they could with the information they had. The difference is the information has changed, much more information in regards to brain science and everything else with early childhood. And so the selling on Broadway uh, was, is totally symbolic of the uh, par radical paradigm shift of the agency, um, you know, five, five and a half years ago. Uh, we know that we, you know, we won't lie to you. Uh, there's so many good points to this presentation. Would love to hear comments and questions at the end. We are struggling um, regionally, nationally with a workforce shortage, especially in uh, mental health. And so we are doing our very finest to um, attract um, skilled clinicians and providers, but it's really tough. And so we can complain about it. We can say, oh, what are we going to do? It's, it's just, this is awful. And it is, it is a challenge, but why complain about it when we know that we have um, the ability to partner that uh, we'll, we'll talk about in a second and develop this workforce uh, development hub, because we know that the whole community, the whole region and nationally, we need to have more infant early childhood and mental health workers that are skilled and have the tools and they need to deal with the incredible challenges that communities and families are dealing with. And embedding, embedding services in the community, we have to do this together. We're only stronger as a collective. And if we think that we're, we are different than others because we are poor, we don't have, you know, this issue or that issue, we're, we're all very similar until we figure out how to really embrace that in our hearts and our souls. Uh, we will continue to have these social issues, and I think things are radically changing. So again, we recognize um, that just stopping there also would not make the kind of progress that we wanted to make in the communities and, and beyond. And so we recognize the need to actually uh, develop some strategies that are working at the population level, where the overarching objective is to lead system and policy change. Uh, with a goal of informing over 300,000 in the three-year period that we identified as part of the plan. I'm going to bring some other voices in to kind of quickly summarize some of these strategies, um, starting with Knox Duncan, who leads all of our marketing communication efforts, also a, a former board member. Knox? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, appreciate everyone being here today. You know, it's... Um, the science tells us that up uh, to 90% of the uh, brain development happens in the ages from birth to six. And yet of the trillions that were spent, as John mentioned earlier in our conversation, only about 14% of that money goes into actually supporting infant early childhood mental health. The adverse uh, childhood experiences then are imprinted on those children that results in the problems of childhood trauma becoming an adverse adult experience. Um, therefore, it is, we feel important that people need to better understand the fact that we can actually have a material positive impact on positive outcomes in life by working more directly with more kids and families sooner. We see that as a movement and we see that as an opportunity to step out and invest in broad reach media that would bring that story to life for people and help people understand that trauma isn't something that happens to someone else or in someone else's neighborhood, but actually it's all around us and childhood trauma is everyone's trauma. So one of the campaign, uh, one of the objectives then of our strategic impact plan is to 
take that movement and message out into the community. Thanks, Knox. There's a Ecology Today article that I quoted earlier with the, the cost of ACEs to society actually said, if there is a call to action, it is to first raise awareness. And, and so the launch of a movement, sometimes referred to as a public will campaign, is about raising awareness. So the population at large is aware of this information that we're, we're sharing here today. And John, can, uh, I, can I add with that just real fast is, yeah. um, Raising awareness is, is one step. It's a very important step. That, that enlightened awareness should cause dissidence. Don't be surprised if you're like, you bump into something, you're like, ooh, this doesn't feel good. And then from there, kind of like what we've talked about with Child Haven, then what do, you, what do you do with that discomfort? What do you do with those new ideas? And that's, I think that's key often takes discomfort to create the action that we they want to take. Um, Charlie is really lucky to have uh, John Gould on staff leading our government relations and advocacy work. And um, John, can you kind of speak to some of our initial efforts in this area? I would be happy to. Hello everyone, John Gould. And, you know, to be frank, we um, as a social service and an early learning and a mental health community, you know, we're, we're in a hole. We have disparities um, that are deep and persistent um, among health outcomes, education outcomes, and life outcomes, um, particularly for kids in adverse communities, um, kids in low-income families, uh, kids affected by systemic racism. So working at the family level is vital. Working at the community level is vital. But if we wanna achieve population level change, we have to also work at the policy and systems level. And we have to create new systems that are built based on the science of early child development, based on the multiculturalism that we have in our community, based on the skilled workforce and skilled parents that Dr. Shankoff talks about and skilled caregivers. And we have to change funding, we have to change norms. We have to change public sector systems, private sector systems. And the only way that we're gonna do that is through partnership. So we're investing in both government relations and advocacy, but also investing deeply um, in partnerships because this type of significant change never happens alone. It never happens from one person or one organization's idea. It absolutely takes partnerships. Thanks, John. I think the point we want to make about partnerships, double down on what John said, is, is it's embedded throughout all of the strategies. It's not a strategy that exists in isolation, but it's embedded throughout everything that we're doing. And, and, and I'm going to go so far as to say that's a pretty unique approach for Child Haven and, and frankly, a lot of nonprofit organizations that tend to, to work as islands. And so we're, um, we're fighting a lot of inertia to actually say we're going to make partnerships core to our strategy in every aspect of our work. And so bullet pointed a few of the areas we're working in and, and uh, Mark and John and Christy and Knox are going to highlight just a few things that we're doing, a few of the specific things that we're doing in these areas. So. Mark, you want to go first? Sure. I really like what you just said, John, in regards to the partnership. Is it, it is a virtue. It's a theme that runs through all three all three levels. Uh, once again, you you know, we we will not take a stance of we know better and this is the community that needs us. And so we're just gonna go in there and, and implement programs that, that will not happen. Uh, what will happen is forming relationships, listening to the stories and figuring out, you know, is there something we can do to support um, the amazing uh, individuals in that community? Um, other CBOs, you know, what John said is absolutely right. I, I think there is oftentimes a feeling of uh, desperation uh, and disparage, disparage disparities and um, with, within the nonprofit culture. And I think it was set up that way that this the system was set up not uh, to be very healthy. And that is not that is not the culture we are we are going to uh, adopt by any means. Uh, and so therefore, you know, we have folks uh, from Rither that we um, partner with. Um, 
our, our wise director is a rather employee. And what we have found out is by doing that, not only do we learn uh, from what Ryder has done in the over a hundred years of providing service, but we're doing some pretty cool things that she takes back uh, to Ryder and, and uh, implements. Uh, we are uh, renting space in 2100 building uh, with the YMCA. And uh, the space is kind of just the platform for us to co-mingle um, and to talk about programs and how we can how we can um, provide better care together with another agency. Schools we get we get calls all the time about can can you please come to our school and provide help? Yes, but that's kind of the old fashioned way of uh, remedying mental health issue because you'll never have enough counselors in a school to deal with the social emotional needs. So how do we get in there, form relationships, and slowly gradually change the paradigm of um, how teachers. Uh, and all school staff interact. University, we have very close relationships with the Barnard Center, uh, which is their Institute for Infant and Early Childhood Development, knowing that if we're gonna really do this hub, we need to partner with the smartest of the smart that have those types of skills so that we, we can provide um, the support, the staffing, the training to really have many, many more providers that are um, properly trained out in the community. Next. Thanks, Mark. Mr. Gould. One of our strategies with respect to partnership we call um, healthcare integration. And what we mean by that is integrating the too often siloed domains of early childhood development and education with the healthcare sector. Um, parents and caregivers of young kids see the health system multiple times when their kids are in this primary area of development. And so Child Haven has forged partnerships with pediatric primary care, where children who come from trauma and adversity um, go to get healthcare. So we have two employees working at Harborview Pediatrics, two employees at Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, um, and possibly future employees at other pediatric primary care sites. Um, and we're learning together with the practitioners at those sites. We're learning about how to culturally adapt screening tools that were written from kind of a white dominant culture to adapt those screening tools to work with families who don't come from uh, the white dominant culture. Um, we're learning about what um, interventions and services help families not only have those skills that Dr. Shankoff talked about, um, but have capital and the ability to navigate systems that they need to navigate for their children's health, well-being, and education. Um, so we are very invested in healthcare integration. Um, it's exciting to infuse an infant and early childhood mental health uh, lens in that work. And um, I'll be around and hopefully there'll be some more discussion and um, talk about partnerships. Sean, one, one extreme example of a, a partnership in a positive way of extreme is, is we had two mergers in June of 2020 with two other community-based organizations. One was Rent Area Youth and Family Services and the other was Art with Heart. And I, I, I raised that up to introduce the bereavement camps and uh, that, that came to us through work with Art with Heart. Knox, can you speak to that? Yeah, happy to do so. You know, as uh, the, the foundational uh, belief here is that uh, it's our job to help bring care everywhere out into the communities and beyond. Um, one of the ways that we're able to do that is through creative expression therapy. Uh, these are um, the Art with Heart books then are working with, with youth as a way to help them use creative expression to get in touch with um, really deep or hard to express feelings. Um, a significant partnership that we've enjoyed has been with the Iluna network. Um, you may know it uh, if you're a baseball fan, uh, Jamie Moyer, uh, the Moyer Foundation. They uh, were founded here in Seattle, ultimately became Iluna. They now operate some camps, youth camps, coast to coast, uh, dedicated to working with youth um, in both the dealing of um, coping with bereavement and loss in the family, as well as um, addiction. So we have our titles that go into their camps where they make those part of the camp programs. 
um, and uh, engage kids in various art activities that um, really allow them to get in touch with that and the, those feelings uh, and begin to better cope with them. Um, in doing so, what this means is that we're able to extend care everywhere, coast to coast. Um, so we've, uh, so far this year, through Art with Heart, have been able to touch the lives of kids, over 11,000 kids and families, uh, through camps like Iluna, Camp Mariposa, and Camp Aaron, as well as others. Thanks, Max. And while it's certainly not unique for nonprofits to talk about partnering with donors and volunteers, I think the way Child Haven is doing it now is a bit unique. And Christy, could you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah. So it won't surprise anybody to find out that really to, to do all of these things requires partnership and investment from our community, from, from funders, from individuals, from foundations and, um, and corporations. And so what we're working on is actually just uh, getting out and talking with as many people as we can and letting them know about the impact that we're striving to have, what you see on the screen here, and really just inviting people to be involved. And the three things that we're really inviting everybody to do are to champion the cause, so to help us get the word out about, about the issue, kind of that, that awareness raising that we talked about earlier, to invite other people to join in, other people that you think would be interested, I know for me, the more I learn about the stuff, the more I think of other people that I want to tell about it. And then to invest, invest in your time, invest your resources as you're able. And so we're, we're working hard to really get out and engage with as many people as we can. And then in terms of volunteers, we, we have some limited volunteer opportunities. That's a program that we're, we're working on rebuilding since COVID. We had, a, we had a bigger program before COVID, but uh, we do have opportunities for groups to come and do service projects and things of that nature. And we'll continue to explore opportunities, uh, other types of opportunities for volunteers as well. But we really are looking to engage with folks around the, the impact of, of the work and inviting folks to invest in that when they're able to. Thanks. So the, 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 the three strategic levels all have arrows that are pointing to something and what they're pointing to is, is really our our purpose, our reason for being, our vision statement, and that's to ultimately positively impact population level health and well-being by ensuring that all children are safe and healthy, thriving physically, socially, emotionally, and educationally, well nurtured by family and community. And um, you know, I, I think I want to give credit to to our board members, many of whom are on on this call. Um, it's not unusual for an organization to have bold vision statements. I think we're we're pretty notorious for that. It's it is original for an organization to develop strategies that are bold enough to actually make headway towards uh, towards the vision statement. And I think what we just covered in those in those three tiers are those strategies that really have the potential, um, if well executed and well invested in, to, to make meaningful progress towards a vision of this size. So with that, we will um, open it up for, for questions or comments or anything that you'd like to add. Absolutely. I'm going to actually kick it off. Dave sent a great question earlier in the conversation. And Dave, I wanted to check in. Dave's question was asking for if we had any specific examples of uh, communities or systems making progress in the areas. And I wanted to check in, Dave, to see did some of the examples we shared answer that question? Or do you want to want to reframe your question and we can address it? Yeah, thanks, Christy. Indeed, it, it uh, some of the question at least was answered through these examples that uh, I guess I though would extend it to ask, are there perhaps other communities outside of our immediate domain or other systems that um, that we, we might look to as examples of where progress has been made or is being made? When we were doing the impact plan, we spent a lot of time doing um, both needs assessments locally, as well as looking at uh, needs assessments that have been done nationally and some of the strategies that other communities had adopted to address similar problems to what we were attempting to address. Um, there, are, there are pockets of brilliance all over the United States and all over the world. Um, there's not a lot that have scaled. So what, what you see is there's neighborhood efforts where you have multi-sectors coming together um, kind of all of those areas that we put in that bullet point list of partnership potentials coming together and aligning their, their strategies and aligning their outcomes and their measurement tools, et cetera, and all working together in a much more collaborative way to, to address some of these entrenched problems. Um, I think, so I, I don't, 
there's one, you know, there's some one in San Francisco and Minnesota, and there's great ones around the country um, that we've seen videos on. We've talked to people. Um, Megan, our former chief program officer, had visited some of them to actually learn from the leaders in them. Um, locally, I think, you know, there may be a, a, an example that hasn't quite paid off yet is there, there's been some effort around homelessness um, to, to address that in a multi-sector way. Um, but, but most of the efforts that we studied were actually outside of the Pacific Northwest. I don't know, does anybody else have any examples? Yeah, I can add to that a little bit. So um, in LA, there's the Magnolia Center, an amazing example of partnership of taking a massive warehouse and putting in all types of different social service agencies that the community had voice and choice about what what they wanted. Now, what's interesting about that is it's on a, it's on a grid. Um, it serves a large community. UCLA is a part of it, which is, you know, a few blocks away. Um, Seattle and King County has some unique challenges in regards to um, poverty. You, you, get, you get in trouble if you start chasing poverty because it's moving all over the place. Um, there are trends on where it's going. So therefore, you know, if you put, you have to be nimble, you have to be fluid because uh, the landscape and demographics of those that are in most need is constantly changing here. And just the mere so size of, of King County uh, makes it challenging. And that's why you see kind of this hub spoke model and making sure that we go out into the communities. Um, but it, it, it does make it a bit different than a place like LA. What other questions do you all have? What can we tell you more about? I have a good question in, in my chat. I don't know if everybody can only send chats to me, but it totally works. Uh, one of the questions is if we have some other examples of, um, of the, the work in education, like other partners in, our, in the education sector. Did I get that right, Jeff? One thing that pops in my mind immediately is up until a few years ago, Child Haven almost exclusively worked with birth to five, birth to six year olds and their families. So we didn't didn't have a lot of partnerships with the K-12 system other than kind of hopefully making a warm handoff from from us and into the to the K-12 system when it happened. Once we merged with Renton Area Youth and Family Services and Art with Heart, um, we kind of inherited some partnerships that they had that we've been um, working to enhance. Mark um, Gould, you might want to add to that. I think it's a, it's a newer area for Child Haven. Yeah, we'll do, do you want to about raise up? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and Renton High School. Yeah, yeah. So in Skyway, um, Folks know we are honored to operate the Cynthia A. Green Family Center and Skyway is served primarily by the Renton School District. Um, so we actually have two partnerships with the Renton School District. One is for a youth mentoring program called Raise Up um, and it works with directly uh, Dimmit Middle School. So very strong relationship with the principal, the school counselor um, and the teachers. And in fact, our staff is at that school um, more than at any Child Haven facility. Um, and the second one is at Renton High School um, and it's mental health related. Um, and it actually is, I would call it a partnership, not only with the Renton School District, but with HealthPoint. Um, HealthPoint operates the school-based health center um, at Renton High School. And Child Haven is you know, essentially the mental health provider um, for, for the school getting referrals both from the school and from HealthPoint. Once again, there's plenty more opportunity in the community. As I said earlier, that we, we get asked by many schools, you know, could we provide some more mental health support? And um, we would love to expand that, that program. Yeah. One of the things I would say that I think we we aspire for in these partnerships is um, a sense of real true integration and not just co-located or not just referrals. You know, we really do want to be seen as 
part of these environments. So our youth life coach who works in the middle school um, want the staff and the parents and the kids to see that that is a capacity of the school. Um, in fact, there's a kind of humility to it and that many people may not even realize that she's part of Child Haven. Um, that's okay because as John and Mark have explained, part of our strategic direction is to bring services to where families already are. Um, and so that's going to feel really different than a big building at Broadway in Boren that has a big sign that says Child Haven and buses uh, of kids coming there. But we believe it's the path to better outcomes is to be more embedded where kids and families are. And, you know, the question was about the schools, um, but that same question could be about the preschools, the childcare. And we have a program called Eclipse that is doing work in Head Start and ECAP programs all across the um, South King County region. Um, I talked a little bit about embedding ourselves in healthcare settings. And I would say we are very interested in what the future is, what, what is on the horizon for those types of true embedding services where families are. See, Jenna put a couple questions in chat. Um, I'll, I'll take the first one and, and uh, John, Rachel, Mark, you guys can take the second one. So thank you, Jenna. Um, so I come from a, an EI background and um, recognized as soon as I got to Child Haven that ESIP was gonna be the first program that we needed to add um, because our pretty much every kid we were seeing at that time was, was a qualifying child and not able to access the services. Um, we have had some fits and starts with that program, um, or primarily around staffing, but I, I'm, I'm really happy to report now that we've got a really strong leader in that program. It's a former executive director of Retin Area Youth and Family Services. So uh, she's now leading both our Healthy Start and ESIP program. We've got a really strong relationship with, with King County and that staff is, is growing and, and strong. So I, um, we have a huge catchment area, um, pretty much all of King County with some of our programs going now into Pearson, Snohomish County. So, um, you know, scaling in a region as large as we're in, it has been a challenge from a staffing standpoint, but, but that program's on the, the right path. And then healthcare integration, John, you're on the screen. You want to take that? Be happy to. Um, we have had a wonderful five months of discussion with CMAR Community Health Centers. Um, about um, essentially doing healthcare integration between Child Haven and CMAR. I don't see anyone from CMAR here on the, on the call, but it's been a wonderful exploration of how do we potentially partner in a very similar way to the existing partnership between Child Haven and Harborview and Child Haven and Odessa Brown, and it essentially be welcoming CMAR into that collaborative. So we've put in an application for funding um, to the Pacific Hospital Public Development Authority, and we'll see. Um, if it comes through, we'll be able to start that in the summer. If it doesn't come through, we'll just look for other opportunities um, to do so. You know, in terms of, um, Jenna, your question about like real true scalability, it's going to take that system change lever to really scale this type of early childhood pediatric primary care integration. We are so fortunate to have best starts for kids, um, but even the best starts for kids levy isn't kind of um, highly targeted enough in this area, frankly, to achieve scalability. Um, but we're interested in any ideas you have on that front. And that example John just gave is a fantastic one in regards to partnership because Dr. Pease from CMAR, good friends with uh, Dr. Abby Grant, who's on our board and is, um, I, I can't, we can't speak highly enough uh, about, about her. And when Dr. Pease heard about the work being done at Harborview, she got interested and reached out to us saying, would you like to have a conversation? And that's what we mean about breaking down hierarchy and, and, and partnership out of trust and report. I would chime in here too, just to add that I think it's also a great example. The healthcare integration is a really great example of where investment and um, philanthropy can sort of give us that ability to to try some of these things out and see what works and get a proof of concept so that we can go back and, and have something to show to say, look, we did these things, we saw these outcomes improve as a result, and we think that it's worthy of investment at a higher level. So it's neat how, how these things are all really interconnected, but I didn't want to lose, lose that, that there's a really important part that, that philanthropy can and does play 
in, in all of these things and helping us get things launched and started and proof of concept going. I had a question to just explain a little more about what EI and ESIT are. Um, so EI refers to early intervention and ESIT is early support for infants and toddlers. It's the, the state, the name of the program statewide for early intervention. And it's, it's for kids birth to three um, who have a, a qualifying developmental delay or disability. Uh, and it's, it's almost exclusively, if not exclusively home and community based. So it was a, a really valuable service that we added um, about three or four years ago. Just want to um, take a moment and, you know, if we all could at some point today, tomorrow, whenever, think about all the folks that are doing really good work. Our staff is working extremely hard uh, during one of the toughest times in our history in regards to mental health issues. Um, and so we're doing the presentation, but it, it is that hard work of every one of the Child Haven staff every day, every moment that is, is going to make this strategy successful. We have time for one last question. If anybody has one last thing they haven't asked yet and they'd like to. I will ask one, it's a softball. John and Mark, what is one, what's one thing that, that excites you looking ahead into the future? That's not softball. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, maybe not a softball. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I gotta just say, you know, I agree with what Mark just said about, about the staff, but I, you know, what, what it does excite me is doing work that matters with people like that I have the opportunity to do it with. You know, when I, when I step back and I listen to everybody speak here and I get to work with our board members and see their commitment and then, you know, interact with our partners and, and our, our investor, donor investors, um, it's just really energizing to be able to do work that matters with people who, um, you know, are ready to roll up their sleeves and get after it. That's what excites me. Fortunately, I had a little more time to think about it as John responded, but um, I, I think I'm most excited about the building momentum of the value of um, early intervention preventative work. Um, it wasn't, you know, when I first started, you know, over 30 years ago, there was no infant early childhood mental health. Um, now, I think we have, we have science and data that backs um, the reasons why we should all be doing this type of work. And it's only going to, it's only going to grow and, and child aid will be a part of that growth. Thank you both. Um, last, last question. I thought that was the last question, but one more. I did get a request in chat. Uh, if John, B, and Mark, if you'd be willing to just take a minute and share what brings you to this work. Um, before we do that, I'll have us close on that, but I wanted to say thanks again, everybody, for attending. And um, I'll kick it over to John and Mark to close us out today. What brings you to this work? What keeps you connected to what we're doing? I'm going to mute so Mark can go first. Is this where you start putting the music on and then slowly? I'm going to do some raise the volume. Music. Yeah, okay. yeah, the walk off music. Is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's really, it's really simple for me. It's, it's, it isn't. Yeah, you can call it work. It's not work. It's, 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 it's a reflection of my life and what, what's happened with me. And it's, uh, my family had the services Child Haven, you know, offered. Um, I think the trajectory of my family would have been extremely different and all the blessings and gifts I've been given. And I've had those personal relationships with adults that believed in me and loved me and validated me, even when I was making knucklehead decisions at times. And so therefore it's, it's, it's a manifestation of, of, um, of my heart. And so that's what you got to do. I still love you when you make knuckleheaded decisions, Mark. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a, in a, an amazing family and had a lot of privileges and I, and I was able to look around and say, not everybody had the opportunities and privileges that I was fortunate to have and that I was able to 
achieve things simply because I had those privileges and not because I had anything special beyond that. And people who had much more to offer to this world who didn't have the same privilege were prevented from, from that access. And that's not okay. Uh, as I had a family of my own, I also experienced tremendous trauma in my life and realized that trauma does exist in every neighborhood in this world. And that some communities are able to hide it better than others, uh, but trauma exists everywhere. And we need these services to address that. 